Hey everyone, Lewis Robertson with Alcove Productions. Um, I've had a lot of comments asking me to uh, do some kind of making of and behind the scenes things and uh, talking about some of the, the riffs that I'm playing in some of the covers and the uh, ways that I'm going about getting tones and settings and things. So um, I thought I'd make a quick uh, kind of behind the scenes making of video uh, for my latest cover, the Steve Vai Juice cover that just recently uploaded. Um, and just kind of walk you through some of the more difficult and more rewarding uh, riffs uh, from the song, uh, as well as some of the settings I'm using for uh, recording it and getting the tones that I am. So, uh, first let's talk about some of the uh, rewarding riffs to play. Uh, for me, I've got two riffs in here that are just really, really fun to play. Uh, first one is this. <laughs> That riff is just so much fun to play. Uh, it's a bit deceptive, a bit of a finger uh, twister, just because in that uh, that kind of melody that we that our ears pick out from these arpeggiated chord structures, um, uh, that melody being those uh, uh, as the melody goes up, your position on the fretboard is actually going down. So. It's a little bit strange, but once you get it under your fingers, it's a really rewarding riff to play. So, slowly it's this. The next riff uh, is a very similar thing. It's arpeggiated chord structures resulting in a melody that our ears can pick out. Um, and it sounds like this. Again, just sounds really refreshing. It's a really wonderful, wonderful riff. Um, really creative. I, I can't imagine how that uh, uh, was written. Um, but uh, slowed down, it sounds like this. Fantastic riff. Um, next, we can get into some of the more difficult and not so fun to play, at least at first riffs. Uh, for me, this starts with the solo section. The whole song's a solo, but what I consider to be the solo section starts with this. Really, really great intro. Starts off with some just kind of basic minor pentatonic stuff. Some blues notes in there. Gets a little bit more difficult. Uh, the next portion where some bends are introduced into that riff. The rest of that is uh, just some uh, fast stuff, kind of pentatonic -y stuff that's not too crazy. Um, from there, it gets into what took me about the entire month from my Satch Boogie cover till this cover uh, to learn, which is the uh, tapping section, which slowed down sounds like this. kind of rude. Um, uh, sped up, it sounds like this. Um, I'd like to thank Steve Vai for uh, giving me a first, uh, that is a blister on my tapping finger uh, from those kind of slides and trills on the tapping section in there. Um, to me, this is a quintessential thing that just sets Steve Vai stuff uh, apart from other stuff. Um, so many guitar players will play fast riffs that are designed to be played fast, things like this. It's all very, very cool, and it is difficult and it's impressive, however, um, it's designed to be played fast. It falls easily under the fingers. Um, 
the thing that sets Steve Vai apart for me is uh, things like this, things that just are strange and really shouldn't be played fast, but they are, probably to dissuade people like me from covering them. Uh, <laughs> it sounds so cool. It sounds really great, and it really does just contribute to that kind of alien-like um, uh, perception of, you know, of Steve as a player. So uh, past that, uh, there are some uh, kind of familiar riffs. If you've covered Steve Vai songs in the past, you might be familiar with uh, this kind of sweep picking shape. <laughs> Like building the church and for love of God might have that in there. Um, uh, towards the end, that does make an appearance here. Just a fun, nice thing that, you know, is nice because my fingers are already used to playing something like that. Uh, same thing, the legato section, you might uh, recognize, you know, these kinds of shapes from other Steve Vai songs. So all those things are fun to play, they're really great, they're really impressive. That particular legato run uh, gave uh, freed my right hand up uh, to be able to put my glasses back on because this particular cover, um, I was at, uh, I think the official release uh, take was take 50 of the song. Um, I had the AC blasting, but I was sweating my butt off in here and so my glasses kept sliding down. So uh, it's a good reason to use legato technique. Uh, give your right hand a break so you can put your glasses back on. Um, so that's kind of the, the general idea of some of the more complex riffs. Uh, surprisingly, there were a few riffs in here that really shouldn't have been difficult, but were. Uh, one of which was uh, um, this kind of climb up of uh, chords and double stops. How's it go? Really, uh, for some reason, deceptively difficult. Um, but uh, when you play it at speed, it usually does come through. So, um, yeah. Uh, moving on to uh, the tone and how it is that I went about getting this tone. Um, starting with the guitar, it is an early um, uh, ebony fretboard version of the uh, Gem 7 VWH. Heavily modified, it has the uh, uh, Fernandez sustainer in the neck pickup. Uh, the stock DiMarzio in the center, and it has a burst bucker from an old Les Paul uh, in the bridge. Uh, the hardware was replaced all with silver stuff a while ago because I wore through all the gold and it was looking silver anyways. And eventually, I was a teenager, I was excited, I was using the whammy bar way too much, and I broke the bridge, and so I needed a new bridge anyways. So um, that's what happened. A whole bunch of people wrote all, all over it. Uh, Steve Vai... Uh, Gary Hoey was very lucky to work with George Clinton, who drew the Atomic Dog and signed it. Um, uh, Steve Vai very nicely wrote some wonderful things uh, about my playing on the back. Some just really great, uh, great people. I've been very, very lucky to work with and meet in the uh, uh, in the industry. Uh, coming from the guitar, uh, uh, which again, this is a very special guitar to me. This is kind of the the guitar that I grew up playing. Um, Moving from that, I come out of the guitar into a Friedman BEOD uh, uh, distortion pedal. Uh, out of the distortion pedal, I head into the Carvin uh, Legacy, the original Carvin Legacy in the distortion channel. Um, out of the Carvin, I'm actually going into the Freyet Power Station. It's a, rea a reactive load box uh, and so much more. Um, basically, I'm not using a real uh, cabinet. Uh, to record. I'll do a, another video if you think it's interesting on how it is that I'm recording uh, without a cabinet and the whole setup, but um, basically uh, I'm simulating the cabinet portion, uh, not the amp, but the cabinet portion in Pro Tools, and then uh, coming back out and running it through some analog processing. I've got the GML 8200EQ running on it. Uh, I have the um, Retro 2A3 Pultec style EQ uh, after that, and out of the Retro 2A3 into an API 2500. The interesting thing that I found while doing Steve Vai covers is API circuits, uh, for some reason, really play a large role in getting the, the Steve Vai tone, at least some of the earlier stuff for me. Um, I found that out as I was recording with uh, some of the earlier things with uh, microphones on cabinets. Uh, I was using vintage Neve preamps. 
uh, and I ended up switching to the API uh, 312 preamps and it made a massive, massive difference in the tone, which was surprising to me. So the API uh, 2500 is, is what's giving us the API flavor there. Uh, past that, I'm uh, uh, using a Eventide H3000 uh, with the dual micro pitch shift program um, using a Yamaha uh, Reverb 7 uh, with the vocal plate preset and a reverb time set to 1.4 seconds. Um, I'm also, I've got a ping pong delay that's bouncing between left and right in, the, in Pro Tools and I also have a 100 millisecond uh, single repeat slap delay. Um, being returned slightly, I think 4% on the right side, with the main guitar uh, coming in 14% uh, on the right side. So that's how it is that I'm getting the tones. The whole mix of everything, the backing track and all, is being compressed by uh, our manly Verimu uh, in the limit mode uh, to kind of match some of the, the harsh compression that was happening uh, on the original track. And um, yeah, it's not an identical recreation, but I think uh, for me, uh, it's about finding the tone that the song lives in, and for me, this is the tone that really kind of spoke the song. So, um, Let me know in the comments if you think that uh, making videos like this is helpful, if you find it entertaining or uh, you know interesting at all. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for uh, liking and subscribing. Um, I'm excited to really get this YouTube channel off the ground. I'm, I think I'm at 180 subscribers now. Um, I'd love to get to 200 and then 500 and 1,000 and start monetizing and doing all that cool stuff. So um, thank you all so much for watching this video, and I will see you in the next one.